Well, Sanker Investments is a is a full service wealth management platform, and uh, I started it because I've been interested in investing since I was at least 13. Um, so I remember just sort of being curious about what what investing was about. Um, so I started investing personally when um, I went to the states for college and was able to open my first brokerage account and started trading. In fact, I, I remember I used to skip class to day trade. <laughs> um, and uh, it was a very interesting time. It was actually uh, in the midst of the internet bubble. Um, exactly. So 98, 97, 98, 99. And it was a very interesting time to learn about investing because I definitely lost what little money I had. Um, so that, of course, got me even more curious about you know, understanding the fundamentals of investing. So after business school, I mean, I initially worked um, in uh, consulting, um, but after business school, I then went to work at Goldman Sachs in investment strategy. And that's where I really feel like I um, just sort of developed the understanding of the theory of investing, like just sort of the true underpinnings of what drives return. So that was just a, an amazing experience for me. And after doing it for a few years, I just realized that I needed to run, you know, my own investment firm. I wanted to manage money directly for people. Um, and it was a, a very interesting time also in Nigeria. This was now 2007, 2008. So of course there was a lot going on in Nigeria, as you know, especially around the stock markets. And at Goldman at that time, I was actually covering, um, I was looking at a wide range of asset classes and was very interested at the time in emerging markets. Um, so I just got into my mind that I needed to start a hedge fund. Um, and so I thought to myself, perfect, you know, Africa is doing fantastic. There's so much global interest in investing in Africa. Why not go back to Nigeria, where I'm from, and go start a hedge fund? And it was really, um, now that I think about it, it was actually kind of bold to do that at the time because, I mean, I was... I don't know, maybe 20, 28, 29. And it's not that I had a lot of investing experience at that point, but I really just felt like um, I would be able to do it. It was, um, so I just sort of left and figured I would go back home. Um, when I came back home, of course, I just realized that I needed to also get some Nigeria work experience. So, and it was pretty much the beginning of the downturn. <laughs> so the timing was not perfect, but at that time, um, I worked for Zenith Capital for a bit and then was able to eventually start Sankara in 2010. And I was truly oblivious to just sort of how difficult it was going to be. I was so driven to do this and to actualize my vision. So I just sort of went in um, and just still determined to start a hedge fund. Um, however, it was very hard to raise money, especially globally. And I realized that there was actually quite a big pool of capital that really wasn't properly managed. And it was mostly individual funds. Um, and so that for me became an interesting place. And I actually stumbled upon it by accident. As I said, I was running a company that was set up to uh, run hedge funds. Um, and I remember having one client who invested possibly, I don't know, it was more than 60, 70% of their net worth in our hedge fund. And I didn't know at the time that it was that large an amount. Generally, you know, globally, you're supposed to, uh, you know, the people who invest in hedge funds are supposed to be sophisticated clients um, and very high net worth individuals who kind of know what a hedge fund is and the level of risk. But it just, it just made me realize that the level of sophistication of even H&I clients in Nigeria is slightly different. I, I wouldn't say it's worse, but the way they understand investments is completely different because Nigeria is just such a different place. Um, so it just sort of showed me that there was an opportunity here to set up something where we would provide investment strategy and guidance to clients while helping them invest at the same time. So that was really just sort of the, the impetus to start the company. <laughs>
actually a difficult one. And that's why I said I decided I needed to work in Nigeria first. I find that to be absolutely crucial. Um, even now in my company, it's very rare for me to hire people with only foreign experience. I think you need to know how Nigeria works. Yeah, you, you need to understand just sort of the way things work here. Um, one of the big things is when you work in Nigerian investments, you have to know everything end to end. And as, when, by that, I mean especially the operational backbone of everything. Um, in developed markets, you don't know all of that, you know? And that was actually the big thing for me is when I got here, having to understand what a registrar does, a custodian does, all those kind of things. Um, you, know, you know, working, I mean, trading abroad, you don't really even think about it. It's just fully, you're not chasing your registrar around for your dividend. It just gets credited to your account by magic. So working in Nigeria, you have to um, know much more about the entire cycle of investments. So you have to be much more of a jack of all trades. So for me, that was the transition, having to understand all of the bits and not just focusing on what the markets are doing and so on and so forth. You take, for example, you can invest in a security that makes a lot of sense and just you not having your operational system set up, you can lose money. You know, maybe just the custodian you have it with just did not collect your entitlements. There was a bonus that was declared. Even that, you know, just the way all those kind of things work in Nigeria, you have to understand it end to end. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're actually very passionate about technology as well. We've done a lot in that space. And even now we're launching um, a wealth management platform that's just targeted towards people who want to get some of the same uh, wealth management advice and um, processes, but already just sort of simplified so that your experience at the front end just doesn't involve all of the mess in the back end. Um, so we actually just launched a platform called Wealth.ng. And our goal there is to give people more of a simple experience with regards to their investing. So again, as you said, it was definitely, you know, a difficult transition, but it's one that we've actually spent a lot of time at Sankri trying to get the operational back end clean in order to give our clients an experience that is um, just simple. So, you know, I, I read that you, you know, you work with clients such as Dennis Capital, Diamond Bank. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned and wanted to understand the Nigerian factor. So yeah, yeah. With working with clients like that, what has that taught you about um, just the Nigerian um, ecosystem, mm -hmm. financial ecosystem, mm -hmm. and investing? Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit. Working with clients here, again, our work with clients is actually quite varied. Um, our company, even though we're a wealth management firm, we focus on a range of things. Um, so we do fund management, we do trust, we also have a registrar. So uh, our clients actually fall into many different categories. At the end of the day, our key priority is the wealth management needs of individuals, but our clients, we engage with them on many different you know, levels. Um, so take, for example, for, for Diamond Bank, we, um, I mean, now access, but formerly Diamond Bank, we actually provided their uh, privilege banking, which is their private banking unit, with um, uh, just sort of uh, white labeled investment products. Um, so that means, for example, that a lot of banks, um, as, as you know, universal banking means that most banks no longer have their own investment subsidiaries. Um, so it means that they still have a need to provide some of these services. And we, um, you know, have been able to step in and say, look, we can provide this white label service for you on the back end. Um, so one of the things that we definitely learned is that, you know, a lot of uh, Nigerian financial institutions, you know, have uh, very broad offerings, uh, but sometimes they may be missing depth in particular areas. Um, and they're aware of this, and that's why, again, they like to work with firms like us that can help provide them with you know, further depth along certain lines. Um, so uh, we actually find that in Nigeria, very few banks have a proper private bank as defined um, based on global standard, you know. Um, and it's something, as I said, a lot of banks are aware of. But they make so much money in the rest of their business. Private banking being much more of a long-term type of business is something that 
they haven't always focused on. Um, but some of the, um, as you know, again, there are three banks who actually have the group structure. So they, of course, focus on it and do an amazing job at it. Um, but the, a lot of the other banks uh, who don't focus on this as a primary focus are the ones who look at companies like us to come help them just provide more of a white labeled approach, which, by the way, is in line with global practice. Um, globally, actually, a lot of wealth management firms and private banks use third-party products. It's only in Nigeria that everyone wants to do everything themselves, you know. So that's part of the Nigerian factor you see. It's just this desire to control. Um, but, you know, true partnerships and collaborations can actually allow you to provide much more, many more services to your clients and keep them happier. You know, so these are some of the things that we have been trying to preach to financial institutions, the benefit of collaboration and partnerships in order to provide more to individual customers. Because, um, again, you can be trying to keep this client all to yourself, um, but then they will leave you um, and you will probably only get a small uh, wallet share, you know, because you're not meeting all their needs. So, again, that's those are some of the things that we've seen just sort of working with. Nigerian financial institutions generally. What are they most worried about in today's Nigeria? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, how are you helping them with some of the worries? Yeah. You know, Nigeria doesn't have a lot of intergenerational wealth. Um, our wealth tends not to pass beyond one, maybe two generations. Whereas in countries like the US, about 80% of private wealth is inherited. So what that means that is that our clients in Nigeria are usually you know, the first creator of wealth. And generally, if you're the first creator of wealth, you're more, you're more than likely to be an entrepreneur, right? So entrepreneurs um, uh, are definitely at this point, you know, quite worried about just sort of, just the big worry is economic growth. Um, we all know that we're creeping along at 2% levels. That's not great for businesses because it, it, just the level of economic activity is very low. Um, so just worries about general economic activity, worries about government policy, because again, Nigeria is very dependent on that as well. Um, so again, you know, you do see um, quite a big focus uh, from our clients, majority of whom are entrepreneurs on just sort of what's going on with the government, what's going on with economic growth and so on, because it has a direct impact on their business. Um, and the way, and, and of course, one of the big policy areas they focus on is uh, the exchange rate, um, which of course makes sense if you're trying to uh, build wealth. Um, and for a lot of HNIs, their spending is global, right? So it means you have expenses in pounds and dollars, you're earning Naira, however, so you're definitely always looking very closely Exactly, at, at FX policy and just sort of what the rate is doing. So um, for, uh, for us, one of the things that we do to help them navigate this better is just proper planning, um, proper provision of information and data. So uh, we actually hold a monthly investment strategy call um, where we just give them a sense of macro, what's going on, keep an eye on the policy changes for them uh, so that we can communicate that with regards to how it impacts their wealth and how it impacts their investment decisions or how it should impact their investment decisions. We also uh, build investment strategy models that are optimized for their global spending. So we do recommend for them to have quite a good chunk of their investments in you know, dollar-denominated instruments and so on and so forth. Um, so for the stuff that's in Naira, we're also encouraging them to start to look at very high-yielding investments in alternatives like real estate and agriculture. Um, it can't all be T-bills and bonds because otherwise you're not compensating for potential depreciation risk. So those are kind of some of the strategies that we employ for our clients. <laughs>really glad you asked that question because it's quite an area of passion for us. Um, um, one of the things that I tell people is, look, um, you have to understand that investing is generally the key to unlocking wealth, um, both for individuals but also for nations at a, you know, at just sort of the largest level. Um, and for us, we have a big mission. Our big mission is not to make rich people richer. 
our big mission is to drive and grow Nigeria's wealth through the deploying of investment assets. We really believe that um, Nigerians unfortunately focus too much on what the government should do rather than what we can do ourselves with our investment money. Um, so because of that, we actually really believe, strongly believe, that H&I have a very strong responsibility to the country through investment. Um, we're so dependent on FDI. We're always sitting here complaining about foreign portfolio investors taking their money out. Why should we be that dependent? Why, for example, should the stock markets drop by 20% because foreign portfolio investors took their money out? Why don't we have enough people here investing in the, our stock markets. Of course, there are many reasons for that, but part of it is also just a lack of proper guidance. Part of it is a lack of proper, um, just sort of uh, investment and portfolio allocation. Um, so we really do think that, you know, there's a strong responsibility on the side of H and I to solve Nigeria's problems, and but they're not. None of these guys are, you know, of course, many of them may be interested in legacy building and philanthropy and so on, but they're, most of them want to build wealth for themselves first. Um, so our objective, uh, the big objective that we um, have is how do we marry the two? How do we get uh, Nigerian HNI to invest in sectors that are beneficial for the economy but also beneficial to their own personal portfolios. We actually find that some of the best investments, some of the best investment ideas do both. Um, one of the key issues that we've seen over the last several years of working with h and in Nigeria is the average Nigerian h and is portfolio is underperforming inflation. So if that is the case, they're not even feeling that confident in their own wealth building they're not going to really be thinking about, you know, building the nation. Um, and the big reason that is, is most of them are invested, too much of their portfolio sits in low yielding real estate. Um, now, there's lots of high yielding real estate that's actually, you know, um, that can actually just sort of uh, be beneficial towards economic growth. But unfortunately, the majority of H&I put their money in three-bedroom flats and luxury areas and so on and so forth. And that is actually not really that beneficial um, because, again, uh, rental yields are so low. Rental yields are 3 to 5%. So if you have 50 to six, some clients as high as 80% of your portfolio in real estate um, and it's low-yielding real estate, then your, your total portfolio return, even if the rest is in high-yielding fixed income, it's not going to be more than six, seven, eight percent, and that means you're not building true wealth for yourself. Whereas there, there are actually um, uh, subsectors of real estate, commercial real estate, um, low-income type of real estate that can yield as high as 20, 25 um, percent. We're looking right now at uh, some student housing opportunities for our clients that can yield as high as 18 to 20 percent. Guess what? That's the type of investment that HNIs really should be putting their money into. If an HNI uh, invests in student housing, that means students, who by the way, majority of them live in really terrible conditions, students can actually live in a better situation and we've actually created value for both sides. So for us, we, we spend a lot of time trying to think about how to find that sweet spot, the sweet spot between um, where H&Is actually make more money than they currently are, because that's the only thing that will drive them to keep investing. And there is some benefit to our country. Um, so for us, that, you know, that's why we spend a lot of time looking at real estate, looking at agriculture, uh, venture capital, and so on. So we do a lot of uh, alternative, we, we look at a lot at um, alternative investment opportunities to show our clients, because we really do think that there's a, there's a strong need for us to aggregate capital in order to solve our nation's problems.